After a freak accident, this dude ends up with fragments of his phone in his brain. The result? He can watch anime just by thinking about it. Just kidding, he has cyberpowers, and boy, you don't want to miss what he ends up naming his superhero alter ego. We catch our first glimpse of Tom, an unassuming nerd, who drowns out the harrowing sounds outside by playing Plants vs. Zombies. You see, his neighborhood is being terrorized by a gang. One day in class, Tom's eyes are laser focused on the object of his affection, Lucy. His mind is blank and his eyes sparkle. It's as if time has stood still and all that exists in this moment is her, Simp. Meanwhile, Lucy is oblivious to the fact that Tom has even entered the room. She's too busy drawing a picture of a pug dressed in a ninja outfit, I think. Suddenly, Professor Bumble snaps Tom out of his trance with a question. It leaves him stumped. An expression of confusion paints over him. The classroom has gone silent and every eye is upon him. Even Lucy has stopped drawing long enough to hear his answer. Uh, turtles? The class snickers. This is geometry. Even Lucy laughs at his ridiculous response. The bell rings and Tom heads for the door. And there's Danny, who's been his best friend since kindergarten. I see you looking at her, man. Go talk to her. Tom feels the blush creeping into his cheeks as he looks over at Lucy. She catches his eye and smiles at him, then starts walking towards them. Danny nudges Tom. See, she wants you, he says before walking off. Now alone, Tom isn't sure what to do, but before he can make a decision one way or another, Lucy is right in front of him. Hey, she says. You got a minute? Tom nods, wondering if he looks as surprised as he feels. I was wondering if you could come over tonight and help me with my math homework. I'm really stuck on this problem. Aha, maybe I'm the solution. Just kidding, he didn't say that. Tom isn't this smooth. Instead, he awkwardly agrees to come over later. But just then, Eugene and his gang of goons pull up to bully him. Fortunately, Lucy shoes them away. A move she'll soon regret. Tom returns home and begins to unwind by watching television. His grandmother is behind him, working on her romance novel. He asks her when he should go see Lucy. She said later, but he doesn't quite know what time later is supposed to be. Truth is, he's just too nervous to make his move. His grandmother senses his hesitation, so with a sly twinkle in her eye, begins reading out loud from her novel. James looked her dead in the eye, undid his belt, and released his. And Tom is gone. Grandma knew how to get him moving. He arrives outside Lucy's apartment, but finds the door is already open. He enters, calling out for Lucy, but only hears distressing whimpers in response. They're coming from the back of the apartment. He ventures deeper inside, calling her name and getting no response. As he looks into one room, he sees Lucy's brother laying on the ground with a bloody gash on his head. Tom makes it down the hallway to Lucy's room as the sounds get louder. As he comes close to entering, masked men emerge and point guns at him. He flees while reaching for his phone. He dials 911 and puts it up to his ear. But before he can utter a single word, bang, Tom collapses. A few days pass. When he opens his eyes, the first thing he sees is his grandmother staring at a book. I'd love to say she was delighted to see he was okay, but I'm not sure what this expression is supposed to convey. Then, a doctor comes in to check on him and declares that all seems well, except for the x-ray of his brain which shows several fragments from his phone embedded in there. If you notice anything unusual, call us. Tom is discharged from the hospital and climbs into a taxi with his grandma. As she goes on about how happy she is that he's okay, he stares at the radio. Strangely, the display starts to flicker, as if to say, please stop staring at me, I'm just an ordinary radio. Later, Tom decides to check up on Lucy, but not before grabbing some flowers. He enters the elevator but runs into Eugene and Cass, gang members and his bullies, though they do press the number for Lucy's floor for him. Hmm, how did they know? Eugene's mean streak quickly opens up as he spots the flowers in Tom's hand. Who are those for? Your grandma? They tease him a little bit before Eugene tells him to give Lucy a big ol' hug from him. He says this with a wry grin that makes Tom uncomfortable. Sus. In her room, Lucy's voice makes Tom feel at ease. She looks happy to see him and the flowers, but then she looks down as her eyes begin to water. Tom vows not to run away next time. Next time, he'll do something. Like what? She counters. In this moment, they both feel powerless, knowing that their attackers got away with it. Tom goes home and finds his head spinning. He can hear electronic noises buzzing from the back of his skull and the sound of various people's phone conversations ringing through his mind. The voices become louder and louder until they are deafening in their intensity. When his grandmother sees him, she can tell that he's disoriented. She knows something is wrong and she's scared, but she doesn't know what to do about it. Tom makes it to his room and passes out. He dreams about his internet router connecting to the phones of Eugene and the other gang members before reliving the attack. After a night of terror, Tom wakes up and wonders if it was all just a dream or if it really happened. During his first class back, Tom is still shaken up from the attack on Lucy. Plus, it's hard for him to concentrate. He can see signals from phones flying through the air like little fireflies. Then, he spots Eugene sending a video of the assault on Lucy to his buddy. With that, he snaps, using his powers to make Eugene's phone fizzle. Come on, man, like, at least make it blow up. Later that night, Tom attends a party Danny invited him to. 
While he sits down, he recalls details from the video of Lucy being attacked and realizes that the people who beat her up are all at this party. He locks eyes with Eugene, who smirks at him sinisterly. Tom marches towards him and just stares at him. Eugene perceives this as an act of war and things nearly get physical. Fortunately, Danny steps in and takes Tom outside to scold him for acting out of line. Tom questions what side he's on, noting his affiliation with the gang, before walking off. That night, Eugene receives a mysterious text from an unknown number. I'm coming for you. We cut to Tom in bed watching YouTube videos on how to hack devices. By morning, he is officially Hacker Man, and he's ready to backtrack Eugene's trail. He tails them while cracking into Eugene's phone, and they lead him to a back alley where they meet with their boss, Cuts. From what Hacker Man can make out, they seem to be arranging some kind of deal. Meanwhile, Tom hides behind a garbage bin. Unfortunately for him, once Eugene and Cass leave Cuts' his side, their path will intersect right where he's hiding. If he runs now, they'll see him. If he stays put, they'll find him. So, he sends them both a text. Behind you! They turn around but only see cuts. And by the time they turn back around, Tom is gone. Truly, Batman-esque in his disappearing prowess. We catch back up with Lucy, who steps out of her apartment for the first time since the attack. She can feel her heart thumping, waiting for someone to jump out at her. But nothing happens. Then, she sees a group of boys approaching her. Her heart leaps into her throat, but they pass by without incident. She composes herself, then we fast forward to later that night. Tom is in his room, spying on Eugene and his gang of bullies with his powers. He's having the time of his life watching them squirm as he blasts music and sound effects through their speakers. Also of note, Cass seems to be doing something suspicious with tissue paper. Weird. The next day at school, there's an assembly about good behavior and responsibility with technology. The principal is going on about how everyone should be doing their part to make sure technology doesn't distract them from their learning. And right on cue, a video of Cass from last night appears on the projector. The students are initially perplexed but quickly burst out into a mixture of chaos and laughter when they realize what they're watching. The teachers scramble to shut it off as Cass runs away, embarrassed. Sometime later, Tom and Lucy are hanging out in her room. He recalls the incident with Cass when Lucy suddenly receives a text from an unknown number. She surmises that whoever it is, they must be the one behind the prank on Cass. Little does she know, it's Tom, who now decides his alter ego will be named iBoy. I wish I was making this up. iBoy vows to watch over her before asking if she has a boyfriend. No, she says. Any love interests? No, she says again, thinking there's nothing romantic going on between her and Tom. This prompts him to ask her out on a proper date. Attaboy. They go out for food and talk about their favorite TikTok dances or whatever teens are into now. When they return home, they run into Eugene and the rest of the gang. They corner Tom and suspect that he's the one that's been messing with them. Things nearly get physical until all the gang members receive a text saying they have the wrong guy. Tom and Lucy get away as the boys fearfully look up, scanning for anyone watching them. Little do they know, Tom, or should I say, I boy, okay actually I don't ever want to say that again, isn't done with them yet. Later at night, the boys spot a nice car practically begging to be broken into. They finesse their way through the door and all pile in, but before they can even get settled in, the car locks on its own. Oh no, step bros, we're stuck. What the? Cass's voice is shaky as he looks around at the other boys. How did that happen? I don't know. Eugene's eyes are wide as he stares at his hand on the locked door handle. I didn't even touch anything. Just then, the sound of the engine starting fills their ears. The car begins to shake and smoke starts pillowing out from the engine. Suddenly, a voice emerges from the radio demanding answers about Lucy's attack. The boys admit they were behind it and ask what they can do to make it right, but the voice only wants to know who ordered them to do it. Cass begins to speak, but Eugene orders him to shut up. Cass listens. Though, they're running out of time. The car has begun catching fire around them, and it's clear that if someone doesn't start giving up names, they're all gonna die in a fiery blaze. It was Cuts, erupts Cass. Oh right, the guy they made a deal with earlier. Apparently, Lucy's brother declined to join the gang, and the attack was his punishment. Now, Tom is on the hunt for Cuts. At the man's apartment, we find him and two other guys inside. One of them is Danny. That can be good. Suddenly, the TV is hacked. A video of someone urinating on Cuts' car appears. The three men rush out of the apartment to investigate. Tom seizes the opportunity and sneaks in. Once inside, he summons his powers to trash the place, throwing things around and destroying furniture. Once he's given them a proper mess to come home to, he rummages around for some food and finds some, uh, rare Himalayan salt. That's gotta be worth at least $1 million in the black market. Mission success. Now armed with this rare Himalayan salt and a ludicrously powerful plan for vengeance, Tom knew what he had to do. He began by planting the salt in the houses of all the gang members. He then called the police, and one by one, they were rounded up. Even tough guy Eugene was taken down. In the aftermath, Tom looked upon the city victorious. The salt gang would never terrorize innocent people again, or so he thought. Following the arrest, Cuts calls up the real boss man, Elman, and fills him in. 
Elman warns Cuts that he needs to get to the bottom of this or he'll cut him. <laughs> little pun there. I'm, I'm sorry. Later, Cuts wrangles up the gang members that were in jail and orders them to steal all the electronics in the neighborhood. As they're dismissed, Cuts pulls Cass aside and asks him if he would ever give up his name if he was in a bind. Ha, of course not. Now, of course, Cuts knows he's a lying snake in the grass, but he dismisses it for now and tells him that everything is going to be fine. We proceed with a montage of electronics being stolen. Yes, even the PS5s. A true tragedy. Tom comes home one day to find the cops in his living room, questioning his grandmother. They too had been stolen from. Having not seen her grandson in quite a while, she takes the opportunity to question his recent whereabouts. Tom doesn't reveal that he's this super cool new hero named iBoy, but rather vaguely explains that he's trying to do something good and create change. Then he leaves. Still seeking answers? His grandmother finds Danny and mentions that Tom's been acting rather odd lately and is rarely home. There's a suspicious look on Danny's face. Meanwhile, Tom is following Cuts by way of bike. His target seems to have stopped, but closer inspection reveals that Cuts simply trashed the phone. Perhaps he decided it was time for an upgrade. Not one to run out of ideas, Tom looks up and taps into nearby helicopters for a better vantage point. With their help, he's able to continue his chase. Sometime later, he ends up at a dock where it appears a deal is taking place. There's some opposition ahead, so Tom quickly downloads some karate moves. But it doesn't stop there. He even downloads this guy's medical history, spotting a weak point in his leg. He strikes it, knocks him down, then puts him to sleep. Tom turns his attention to the container before him. Inside, he finds a ton of s -s salt. In an instant, he is attacked by henchmen who beat him up and leave him crying on the ground. He takes quite a beating before inventing a new power for himself. That's right, he can now spontaneously make people's ears ring really loudly. The disorienting attack causes the henchman to back down and Tom runs off. The next morning at school, Lucy asks why he stood her up for a test yesterday. She's upset since they were supposed to take the exam together. Then, as they walk outside, they spot Cass. Just hanging around. What a goofball. Oh, oh wait. Later that night, Tom is awakened by a sound, so he gets up to check things out. What he finds is the cold touch of a gun pointed at the back of his head. And that's where this whole adventure goes south. He's forced into the living room where Elman, the big bad boss, is waiting for him. The timid Tom just stands there petrified. Suddenly, his sassy grandma pulls up and curses out the baddies before getting knocked out. She's fine, I think. Luckily, Elman doesn't seem too keen on hurting Tom, at least not yet. You see, he reveals an odd suspicion he has. He believes Tom can control electronics with his mind. How he somehow figured this out, I don't know. Anyway, all Elman wants is for Tom to use his cybernetic powers to transfer money into his account. Brilliant. Of course, Tom declines, and that's when Elman shows him the true power of money. He brings out Danny and reveals that he's the one that tipped him off to the fact that Tom might be the one causing them trouble. This still doesn't explain how he knew about the powers, but whatever. He goes on to explain that Danny did this all for little pictures of the queen, aka cash. He commands Danny to open his mouth, then stuffs it with money before dismissing the traitor. This display of dominance does little to sway Tom, so Elman brings up another one of his friends, Lucy. Oh no. Tom uses his powers and finds that she's been kidnapped. Left with no choice, he begins slowly transferring money to Elman's account. All the meanwhile, he's triangulating Lucy's location and sending it to the cops. All is going well until an observant Elman spots Tom's expression change. Turns out, he was reacting to the cops pulling up on Lucy's location. Elman has his goons check in on the situation. There's no response. Looks like they'll be taking this on the road. In the car ride over, Elman notes just how special Tom is, and then mentions that he knew his mom. Apparently, she had the softest hands in town. Whatever that means. Meanwhile, the cops raid the warehouse Lucy's in, but she's being hidden by the goons. Eventually, the cops leave, and in their celebration, the boys lose sight of Lucy for just a moment. And a moment is all she needed to strap up. She points the Glock at the lads who immediately have a change of tone. Suddenly, they're all nice and forgiving. Lucy forces them to apologize for attacking her, and they swear they'll never do wrong again. Soon after, Elman pulls up to the warehouse. Lucy greets him with her gun, but is outnumbered. Then, the boys who swore they'd change their ways come back and hold her at gunpoint. Tom is brought to his knees and forced to continue transferring money. For some reason, he's unable to. Tensions escalate as Elman pushes him. Then, Tom speaks up. If you could walk away right now, would you? Not the time to be delivering lame one-liners, bro. Anyway, Tom causes all the gang members' phones to explode. Somehow, this puts everyone to sleep, except for the final boss, Elman, who was far from defeated. After a short battle in the pouring rain, Tom is just about done for, but he whips out his ringing ear trick, creating a momentary state of confusion in his opponent that gives Tom just enough time to, uh, get beat up again. Suddenly, Lucy appears at the door and shoots Elman. Just kidding, she misses every shot. As they face defeat once more, one more bullet miraculously appears in the magazine. 
She hurriedly aims at Elman, but only manages to nick his arm. He marches forward, but then Tom gets up. He grabs Elman's attention as he charges up his powers. With a violent blast, Tom lets out a surging wave of 5G energy. Elman is quite literally blown away by its incredible speed, power, and low latency. It takes a lot out of Tom too, who passes out. Later, he wakes up at the hospital, his grandma by his side once more. And just as before, she seems not so thrilled to see him wake up. Our riveting story ends with Tom and Lucy peering over the city and officially becoming a couple. Moral of the story? I boy. <laughs> Stick to Android. Now, hit that subscribe button. My boy. <laughs> Uh-uh. <laughs>